Hello and welcome to this Facebook Live seminar. My name is Dawn Stevens and I am the Medical Education Manager for ESSET. I'm joined by Dr Leanne Aiken, Vascular Nurse Consultant from Yorkshire. Today we are looking at delivering compression therapy safely and in particular what to look out for in a vascular assessment. So before I hand over to Leanne, who's going to take us through a lot of information tonight around compression and around vascular assessment, I just wanted to cover the learning objectives for this evening. So first of all, we're going to look at leg ulceration and how much time do we actually spend looking after legs. We're going to talk about getting it right first time, the approach to leg ulcers, and also looking at some new guidance on starting compression without a Doppler. Let's not waste time in getting these patients into compression. We're going to want to understand what is involved in a vascular assessment to make it safe to start compression early. And where is the evidence to support bandaging versus leg ulcer kits? How does compression actually help our patients? And then me and Leanne will have a live Q&A together where we will discuss some of the topics that Leanne's covered this evening before we'll move on to the live Q&A um, from yourselves. So I'm just going to set the scene really just before Leanne starts talking to you about the new guidance that's come out and also about how to perform a vascular assessment. We have heard lots about the burden of wounds study in 2015 that talked about managing patients with wounds and their associated comorbidities is costing us an estimated £5.3 billion per annum. Now we know that for providers and commissioners, the delay in wound healing relates to resources being consumed inappropriately. And this recent study obviously highlighted some of the things that we probably could do a little bit better in improving outcomes for patients. Now we know that from the burden of wound care and um, burden of wounds, they highlighted that wound management is a nurse led discipline, which I'm sure is no surprise to any of you. We know that two thirds of wound care is managed in the community setting and the cost of wound care is actually higher than the cost of managing obesity because obesity is roughly 5 billion and obviously as I've alluded to, wound care is 5.3 billion. We know that 10.9 million community nurse visits are recorded to manage wounds per year and actually 18.9 million practice nurse visits and clinic visits are recorded to manage wounds. But we're now, tonight we're going to be specifically talking about leg ulceration. So we know that roughly 3% of the adult population worldwide is affected by leg ulceration. And a recent study that was um, delivered, was completed, suggested that between 2012 and 2013, the NHS managed an estimated 278,000 patients with a confirmed venous leg ulcer. Now, the annual cost of managing these venous leg ulcers and their associated cost, uh, comorbidities was estimated to cost roughly £941 million. The NHS also managed 420,000 patients with an ulcer of the lower limb without a differentiation diagnosis. So that in itself is costing anything up to £778 million. Now the thing I want to highlight here is that the burden of wounds actually highlighted that there was a lack of holistic assessment with some of these patients, but actually 41% 41 of, the, 41 of the all wounds were of the lower limb. Now when we looked at Dopplerin and the ankle brachial pressure index, we found that 84% of those patients didn't have a Doppler but 46% of those patients were actually in compression therapy. And I want you to think about that and remember that figure when Leanne's um, doing her presentation this evening, because we want to get you putting patients into compression earlier and not delaying that treatment whilst we're waiting for a Doppler. So I'm now going to hand you over to Leanne. Thank you, Leanne, if you'd like to so deliver. Dawn's beautifully articulated the problem that we've got out there and the scale of the problem. And many of you, you'll be facing this problem on a day-to-day -day basis. Dawn's articulated the burden to the NHS, but, for, um, but many of you are treating patients, as you can see. And really, you have to ask yourself, are we providing the best care for these individual patients? Is this truly effective care? And unfortunately, this won't be a shock to many of you out there. You will recognise these images, and many of you will have patients with similar clinical issues as being shown here. And really, is this good enough? And the answer is easily no. The burden of wound study led to many things happening. 
It bed to the NHS England start an initiative called Adding Value Leading Change and this started now a number of years ago. And this articulated through the Betty story, which is still available on YouTube for you to have a look at. It's a fantastic little animated video showing that how we are getting it so wrong at this moment in time. But when they looked at the financial burden of this, they found that the suboptimal care, which the majority of patients are getting at this moment in time, cost the NHS 10 times more than actually if we got it right first time. So that formed a huge body of work, which is being led by the National Wound Care Strategy Programme, which is an NHS England and NHS Improvement Programme, which is being led by the Allied Health Science Network. We all recognise that this needs a whole system change. This isn't just a little bit about putting a different dressing on or getting the patient to see a different clinician. This is about looking at every element and every touch point with a patient with a lower leg wound to say, how can we improve that care? And thankfully, we have got guidance now coming from a national strategy informing us as clinicians of how we could and should treat these patients to improve those outcomes. And that strap line, getting it right first time, has never been so important than when you're thinking about venous leg ulceration. The National Wound Care Strategy has produced a lower limb clinical navigation tool. I'm quite fortunate to be the chair, along with Brenda King, of the lower limb strategy for the clinical navigation tool. And we've produced this as an aid memoir of what we should be doing with each patient that we see. Some of this involves a real step change. The first thing that we're asking is that we should ensure that the initial care for a patient that we see is correct. At this moment, you'll see that this guidance is within draft. It's currently out for clinical consultation. The consultation changes within the next few weeks. So far, we haven't received any major amendments to this. So we don't think this is going to be changing greatly. And I'm so grateful to Essity to invite me here today to try to start the implementation of this clinical navigation tool because we all need to be singing from the same song sheet if we are going to make a difference across the UK to every patient that we have with a lower limb wound. So the initial care is going to be provided by anybody. We want every clinical member of staff to be able to assess for simple red flags and red flags should indicate an immediate escalation to somebody else. We want you to do that on your initial assessment of that patient and this could be delivered within a community pharmacy. It could be a non-registered member of staff, it could be a GP, it could be any form of nursing and everybody should be able to assess for those simple five red flags. We've also added in some, where, some indications of where you should discuss with clinical specialists and we've tried to align this with national guidance. It is to be pointed out that this work has been done by NHS England. However, it's work that is evidence-based and it highlights best pra practice providing a clinical navigation tool. I say that this should be used across the UK. It's, we use sign guidance in terms of peripheral arterial disease, so there's no reason why this shouldn't be used across all of the United Kingdom because we all have the same issues when it comes to inadequate and inappropriate care. So let's just spend 10 minutes looking at these red flags to try to ensure that you have some confidence in this. Many of you out there will already be able to do this. It's just about giving you a little bit more of education regarding this and helping to build up your confidence within this area. So the first red flag that we ask you to assess is simply whether there is signs of spreading infection on the leg or the foot. In other words, has that patient got signs of acute cellulitis? You know how to diagnose this already, but remember that cellulitis is a spreading systemic infection. It's not a localised wound infection, and therefore you will have clinical systemic signs of that patient. That patient will often have a, a temperature. They'll often be showing signs of having a raised pulse in terms of tachycardia. There will be inflammation which can be clearly defined with a clear border between the inflamed tissue and the normal tissue. This is often associated with edema and swelling and the skin can start to resemble orange peel where the hair follicles are tethered down to the dermis layer so therefore you get this orange peel type effect of the skin. You will have 
um, elimination of all fine lines because the Dima expands the tissue so the tissue looks soft and quite shiny. It will be warm to touch if not hot to touch. And remember, because this is an infection, your patient will be showing signs of systemic infection. In other words, they will feel unwell. They may well have flu-like symptoms. They will feel general malaise from this. Cellulitis is a big burden to the NHS, but actually it's one of the biggest misdiagnoses too. So we need to ensure that we've got an educated workforce that can assess for cellulitis, but also can assess for its differentials of when it is simply as related to venous hypertension. But the first assessment of the red flags is whether the patient has got signs of spreading a, 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 a systemic infection on the leg or the foot. If any of you out there saw a leg or a foot like this, you don't need me to tell you that that patient doesn't need compression therapy. You don't need me to tell you that you need to escalate that patient up to larger services because you know this as part of your fundamentals of your assessment skills. You need to listen to that sixth sense because it's often right. If you've got a leg where you believe that there are signs of infection, that needs to be escalated. You're doing that currently in your clinical practice. We're just formulating it within an assessment which requires a staged approach. So that's the first stage of assessment. Is there infection on the foot or the leg? The next assessment that we want you to do is the one really where any form of compression could make things worse. And this is limb-threatening ischemia. This is often ischemia and tissue loss on the foot. It's very rare to get a true arterial lesion on the limb itself. It's quite easy to diagnose because these ischemic areas are often black in terms of necrotic. They are always associated with severe pain unless the patient has neuropathy. You often find that the foot itself has got dependent ruber, so it looks like a sunset red foot. And there's a great way to assess whether this is due to ischemia. When you have a red foot due to ischemia, you've got full dilation of the arteries, so you get arterial flushing. If you simply elevate that leg to the level of the hip, you will see that the redness starts to drain away and the foot turns pink and then to white. That is an indication that that colour is due to flushing of the arteries and therefore a sign of limb-threatening ischemia. If that redness was due to infection, it doesn't matter whether you elevate that leg or put that leg dependent, that redness will always be there. Patients with limb-threatening ischemia do not require urgent admission. They don't require attending A&E, but what they do require is an urgent referral to a vascular service. And that patient should be seen within that vascular service within 14 days of that referral. Another assessment in terms of the red flags that we need you to make is whether the patient has a suspected DVT. Once again, this is not new. You're doing this when you're assessing any patient with a new presenting problem of the lower leg. But let's just recap on the symptoms of DVT. It's limb congestion, but often just unilateral, one-sided. It's of a sudden onset, it appears over the last 12 hours. The patient can report pain when they are flexing the ankle. They'll also report pain if you're actually pressing on the back of the calf. You can have some discoloration in terms of the leg can look red or purple, slightly mottled in places. It can be warm to touch, but often a DVT has got a preceding event. So it's been caused by something else. So the triggers that you need to be thinking about is if that patient had a period of immobility, have they been recently had any surgery? Have they been on a long haul flight? Have they got some form of cancer? So all of these make you more prone to having a DVT. But again, if any patient presented with you with acute sudden onset edema in one leg, you've already got your heckles raised in terms of this is something that you need to escalate. And the final assessment that we ask you to, act to, to assess for is whether there is suspected skin cancer. We have many patients out there that are being treated for venous leg ulcers when in effect it's a basal cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma. Both of these wounds here are diagnosed cancers. If you have any lesions which look bumpy, blemished or they change, the patient reports that it gets crusty, oozing and intermittent bleeding or if they're reporting that it's itching or tender or has got any type of purple tinge, raise your suspicion that that actually could be an undiagnosed skin cancer. 
Try to reduce your tolerance for a biopsy. A punch biopsy is an easy skill that many nurses can be trained in doing. Maybe we need to be bringing that forward in our clinical pathways so that we are proving it's not malignant rather than actually treating these patients with an unconfirmed diagnosis for a period of time. So we've asked you to assess for those red flags. I say to you all now, I think you're already doing that. I don't think there's anything new. We want you to discuss with the relevant clinical specialist if you've got any concerns about acute heart failure. Because in acute heart failure, compression therapy may be contraindicated. But please don't let that be confused with chronic heart failure. When patients have got chronic heart failure, they will have lower leg edema and they will have a shortness of breath that's been going on for a long period of time. Compression therapy in chronic heart failure is not contraindicated. In fact, it's often required. Only if that patient is in acute heart failure can your compression actually do some harm. And remember that acute symptoms happen suddenly. They can often be associated with palpitations and an acute sudden shortage of breath where the patient could be coughing up pink foamy mucus rather than um, phlegmy type mucus. And remember that there is a blood test for you to be able to assess whether a patient's in acute heart failure or not. The BNP blood test is a great indication and if you've had a rise in the BNP, maybe that's an indication that the patient is now in acute heart failure. But most patients in a community setting won't be in acute heart failure because by default, if they are, they might need to be in hospital. But if you've got any patients out there that have got chronic heart failure, they are appropriate to be in compression therapy. And in fact, it is required in those patients to help to control their edema. The other discussion we want you to have is just a sense check. In other words, is that patient within the last few weeks of their life? We have implementation across the UK now about the gold standard framework, trying to identify patients within the last year of life, and then the last few months and the last few weeks. We need a sense check that if a patient is in the last few weeks of life, we need to be focusing on their comfort, the time with their family, not about trying to heal a leg ulcer and certainly not about referring patients into hospital and having times of secretary care. What that patient wants is to be in their own environment and we need to ensure that we're having this appropriate assessment, both of the patient but also these conversations with the family. None of this is new in terms of what we're asking you to do in terms of diabetic foot management. We've not changed any of that. That's quite clear within the NICE guidance of what we should be doing with patients who are a diabetic who present with a foot ulcer. Those patients within 24 hours should be referred to your local diabetic foot multidisciplinary teams. That has not changed. This is only to do with lower leg ulceration that is not a diabetic foot. So just to recap, all we're asking you to do is an immediate bet initial red flag assessment. Has that patient got spreading infection? Have they got a hot swollen foot or leg? Have they got evidence of limb threatening ischemia? Do you suspect a DVT or a skin cancer? If you've got none of those we're asking you to do something rather bold and brave. We're asking you to put on 20 millimetres of mercury pressure straight away. That's going to be the challenge going forward. But the initial care needs to involve the fundamentals too. We need to be wo washing and cleansing that skin and that wound at each opportunity. It's a fundamental aspect of care. We want patients wherever possible to have a simple low adherent dressing with sufficient absorbency and that should be the first dressing that you're reaching for if that's appropriate for that wound bed. And any patient at that point without any further vascular assessment no ABPI, no palpation of the foot pulses. We want that patient to be putting 20 millimetres of mercury pressure at that initial point. We also want that patient to be referred to an appropriate clinician to have an advanced assessment. And if that is a foot wound, that should be within 48 hours of initial presentation to a foot pr practitioner, predominantly a podiatrist. And if it's a leg wound, then that patient should be seen within 14 days of that initial presentation. All of that is a great shift. But at the moment, all we're doing, patients are being seen, but they're being seen quite late in the pathway. All we're doing is moving that late appointment earlier on. Because if you had a wound on your lower leg, wouldn't you want an assessment in a timely manner with somebody with some skills to know what they are doing? Wound 
um, cleansing and skin cleansing is a fundamental aspect and unfortunately it's the part of legal to care that's being cut it's being cut because nursing staff don't have time we not we can't let this cut this is what is a fundamental aspect of care these pictures that you can see is a simple leg pre and post wound and skin cleansing that takes 10 minutes of clinical time. Which do you think looks better? You don't need to have any knowledge to be able to see which looks better. All of that takes is to wash and cleanse the skin using whatever you can. To actually cleanse the wound bed itself. We've all been taught not to cleanse the wound bed, but that is changing. The biofilm that we know that's on that wound needs to be removed at each and every opportunity. We need to be debriding the wound wherever we can using any type of surfactants, any type of monofilament pads or any type of simple moistened gauze. We need to be removing whatever visible tissue we can because you can instantly see by spending five, ten minutes doing that, you're actually going to change the healing trajectory of this wound. And we need to make sure that we have got time in our job plans and in our diaries to be able to perform that fundamental aspect of care. The second aspect is that we just want you to, if at all possible, apply a simple low adherent dressing with sufficient absorbency because the evidence really isn't out there to say which product is better than the other so really what we should be going for is the most simple but with leg ulcer it is so important that we get sufficient absorbency because all of these images that you can see now their wounds have deteriorated because of poor moisture management so as much as the national wound care strategy is saying low adherent you need to have an assessment of the amount of moisture that's coming out of that wound because certainly lower dim dressings would not be suitable for any of the pictures that's shown within that slide at this moment. So we need to consider wound bed preparation but that needs to be after the compression because the compression is key with any patient with a venous ulcer. So first line we want you to apply 20 millimeters of mercury pressure. That can be a, a reduced compression bandage, it can be some form of compression hosiery. We're, only, we're not stipulating what, but we're stipulating get 20 millimetres of mercury on that patient as soon as you can. And the only assessment that you need to do prior to application is that simple assessment according to those red flags. You may think, gosh, that's quite bold and brave, but I'd just like to turn things on its head. At the moment, like Dawn articulated, we've got 420,000 patients with a wound on their lower leg without a diagnosis. So they're not getting any compression when many of them will require at least 40. We know the older the ulcer, the harder it is to heal. So we have an opportunity in that first six months of wounding to get these wounds to heal. If you've had a wound for more than six months, you've only got a 10% chance of that wound healing in the next six months. The harm of the delays of the assessment and compression therapy is the biggest harm to our patient group at this moment in time. Many of you will be thinking, gosh, if you think about applying compression without doing an ABPI or feeling foot pulses, you may think of this may provide bandage damage like shown in that picture. But the chance of that happening is very, very small. If you've assessed for the red flags, the chance of that happening is absolutely tiny. We've had this discussed by numerous vascular consultants across the UK and none of them have got an issue with you applying 20 milligrams of mercury pressure instantly. And the reason for that is actually it's not harmful. Actually, when you look at this, the harm is the other side. The harm is no compression. How many patients have you got with circumferential legs, leg ulcers, with huge congestion in their lower legs? This is all due to the delays of compression. That's more harmful. How many times do you see a patient with congestion, with leg ulcers that are circumferential, that are complex to heal? Every day. How often do you see a patient with bandage damage? Hardly ever. We have to start being less fearful for compression. There is harm in our apathy of doing nothing. Every complex leg ulcer that's circumferential on that really stubborn, hard, solid edema started off as a simple lesion on a patient with soft edema. Imagine if we could reverse the clock. Imagine if we could get that patient into compression right from their initial assessment of day one of presenting to any care setting. What a different world we may live in. We have to remember the benefits of compression. There are loads of benefits to compression, both from a venous point of view, but also from an arterial point of view. Venous incompetence 
and edema will reduce the arterial flow because you've got additional pressure on those arteries. Venous hypertension reduces the intravascular pressure gradient. Therefore, it reduces perfusion pressure. Edema pushes the capillaries apart, increasing the distance between the blood vessels and the cell. All of that impedes nutrients and oxygen transportation. But all of those factors that I've just described can be helped with the use of compression. The biggest challenge of the National Wound Care Strategy is to the timeline. We need to be doing things sooner. We want that initial care to be given from day one and we want every patient from day one to be referred for an appropriate assessment. And within 48 hours of a foot wound and 14 days of a legal wound, we want that patient to be seen by somebody with advanced assessment skills. We know that we need to be doing this earlier. So within 14 days of that presentation, we want that patient in front of somebody that has the ability to undertake a whole complete holistic assessment. Assessing the clinical and psychological needs of that patient. Assessing that wound and documenting it using the minimum wound um, data state, state, set that's already embedded within much of your clinical practice. But for somebody who can perform an ABPI using a handheld Doppler at that point within 14 days. We want somebody who's going to be able to formulate a treatment plan to be able to assess that patient, to diagnose that patient as having a venous ulcer or any other form of ulcer, could it be? But we want that patient, if they have got signs of venous disease, then somebody should be talking to that patient about the requirement for surgical intervention of the veins. And I'll go into that in a couple of minutes. Even for leg wounds, even if you've got no signs of venous disease, so long as they've got an adequate arterial supply, then we want that patient into full strength compression. Because actually we've looked at all the evidence and there's more harm of not compressing those non-venous leg ulcers than actually providing them some compression. So how do you diagnose the etiology of a leg ulcer? Well, you do it like you diagnose anything else within your advanced clinical practice. You take a detailed history. You look at the vascular risk factors, are they overweight, have they got diabetes, have they been a smoker, have they ever had a heart attack, have they had a stroke, have they got risk of having atheroma in a different vascular bed. You're going to undertake a physical examination, you're going to look at that patient, that limb and then that wound. You're going to look for signs of ischemia, of venous eczema, for staining of the skin, for edema. And then you're going to look at that ulcer. How did it present? What does it look like? Does it look like a classic venous leg ulcer around the gator region with ill-defined borders which are irregular? They often have some sloughy tissue and they often are highly exuding. And as part of that assessment, after 14 days of presentation, that patient should have an ankle brachial pressure index undertaken. But remember, the ABPI will never diagnose venous disease. All it does is assess that patient for the presence of arterial disease and most importantly, the safety of that patient to have full strength compression. The reason why the ABPI is still there within the clinical navigation tool is that we need an assessment before that patient goes into 40 millimetres of mercury pressure to make sure there is no underlying venous uh, arterial disease. The pictures that you see now, you can see atheroma within the artery. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see two magnetic resource angiograms. And you can see on the first image that that patient on their right leg has got a long blockage from their iliac artery down to their popliteal artery. That patient would be presenting with some form of ischemia. They would probably have a sunset foot and necrosis of their toes. They will be easy to spot for you when you would never even entertain putting that patient in any form of compression. But the reason why the ABPI is there is to keep your practice safe. Because on the image on the far side of the screen with a little arrow shows slight disease within the common iliac artery. That patient, if they did went into full strength compression, you could actually reduce the perfusion of the foot, therefore making their symptoms worse rather than better. Therefore, the ABPI still needs to be a fundamental aspect of your assessment, but we need to stop making the excuses and the time delays, and that needs to be done within 14 days of presentation. Remember what the ABPI is. 
it's a simple vascular assessment. It's a simple ratio of how much good blood is getting through the brachial arteries versus what's getting to the legs. By for the last 10 years, this has been mystified as a special assessment with special competency. It can only be formed by nurses who are registered and have undergone additional training. I think we need to break all those barriers down. I think that this should be a competence-based skill, provide, which could be provided by anybody. And I would be a training my HCAs to do this. Nursing has moved on tremendously. We need to move on with the ABPI being a protected skill. We have... Um, Clinical support workers now, cannulating patients, taking bloods, doing ECGs, to me this is just another skill. Yes, you need a registered member of staff to be able to make the diagnosis, but actually to do the test, to me it should be anybody with the capability to do that. So long as there's evidence in terms of competency, then they are safe to do that. There's a lot of use of automated machines. If they're helping you to assist you in making this assessment, bring them on. I personally prefer a handheld Doppler because it gives you so much more information if you become good at doing this. But the challenge is at this moment in time, many of you will be doing ABPIs and some of you will be reaching that two week target. But what happens to your patient if the ABPI that you've just undertaken is 1.5? What do you do then? Because many of you within the policies and guidelines, it will say you have to refer that patient to a leg ulcer clinic, a vascular clinic. But how long is that time? from that point of referral to that patient being seen. And what happens to that patient in between that time? At the moment, they're not in any form of compression. At least within the new clinical navigation tool, they will be at least in 20 millimetres of mercury pressure. But actually what we need, rather than referring that patient on, at that point of that two week assessment, we need somebody with the appropriate skills to be able to do that. We need to be looking at advanced skills of being having practitioners that's able to use the ABPI but other skills that they have in terms of arterial assessment. I don't think that needs to be a whole new range of advanced nurses being coming to you and being employed by you. I think that could be you. If you've got a passion for leg ulcers, why would you not want to get brilliant at this? There is a fantastic a capability document that's been produced by Health Education England that actually covers multiple clinicians. It doesn't matter if you're a podiatrist or a nurse or a physiotherapist. This tells you about your core capabilities of what you need to be able to prove to take the advanced assessment. And we need that advanced assessment within 14 days of that patient having a wound if we're ever going to change the current status. So once we've got that, we, all, we, we just want your patients to have an appropriate assessment, an appropriate diagnosis. And then that patient needs to be put into 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. But that patient also needs an assessment of their underlying venous disease. I want you all to start looking as a leg ulcer as a weed. You won't go into your garden and simply chop your dandelion's head off. You'd actually dig down to get the weed, get the roots of the weed. Within a venous leg ulcer, it's exactly the same. All you're seeing is the surface, the flower on the top. The roots are within the venous system and we need to be able to change that system if we're ever going to get that wound to heal. That can be done by compression therapy because compression therapy has been proven as an anti-inflammatory device of venous hypertension. And yes, that needs to be done at the same time as good wound bed preparation. However, Compression in a way is a palliative form because it needs to be there forever. But within the NHS, across the whole of the UK, NICE recommends that patients with venous leg ulcers should have an assessment for venous insufficiency with an ultrasound scan. And if appropriate, patients should undergo venous ablation using minimally invasive techniques. And why do we recommend that? Well, there was a fabulous randomised control trial that was published back in 2018 now called the Everest study. That randomised 450 patients into having compression or having surgical intervention of the veins plus compression therapy. And the results were that they were able to heal patients 30 days quicker by operating on their underlying venous insufficiency at the same time as pay having patients into compression. Please don't think that this is a big operation. This is minimally invasive, local anaesthetic, walk-in, walk-out, day case procedure. It doesn't matter how old you are, how infirm you are, you can still have an assessment for this intervention. And when we talk about healing 30 days quicker, that's massive. That's 30 days less input for you and your service. 
That's 30 days less expensive dressings, but it's 30 days less suffering for your patients. And if you had a venous leg ulcer due to chronic venous hypertension, would you like to be in compression therapy forever? Or would you like an intervention that's going to cure you? To me, it's a bit of a no-brainer. And that's why it's embedded within NICE guidelines at this moment in time. If any of you are interested, though, it's hidden within NICE varicose vein guidelines. It does mention venous leg ulcers, but it's not in the easiest place for clinicians to find. So we're asking for every patient out there to be assessed for the appropriateness of venous intervention. And therefore, every, following that, every patient should be applied 40 millimetres of mercury pressure. If a patient is suitable, they should have a hosiery kit first line. A hosiery kit which provides 40 millimetres of mercury pressure at the ankle. It doesn't matter which manufacturer you choose, the evidence is only there for compression hosiery kits. And if a patient has got a leg and a wound that is suitable, that should be your first line approach. But for some patients it won't be. If you've got a patient with edema, swollen ankles or soft swelling, you may require a period of bandaging first. If you've got a wound that has got copious amounts of exudate, then a compression hosiery kit is never going to be suitable. Compression has been known to be um, essential in the management of venous leg ulceration. We know this by randomised control trial, systematic reviews, meta-analysis. It's the only thing really that Cochrane tells us in wound care which is good. We need compression to be the key. But compression's come a long way. When I first started, the gold standard compression therapy was the Charing Cross system. We had four layers of bandages were put on. But things have come a long way. The evolution of compression has been massive. We've now got two layer bandage kits which have got evidence to say they're as good as four layer. We have short stretch bandage systems designed for edema. We have compression hosiery kits where the compression value is within the garment. So it doesn't matter who puts it on, you'll always get perfect compression. And we have leg wrap systems. But the future's not just ending there. Smart fabrics and smart technologies are coming into this space, so watch out for the future. But we need to embrace what we know now. You can class compression hosiery kits as good as multi-layer bandaging. We know that from a randomised control trial called Venus Far, which was published back in 2014. And many of you may be aware of the Atkin and Tickle leg ulcer algorithm that we created a few years back, trying to get this into everyday practice. The reason why we want hosiery kits in everyday practice is that they hold so many advantages. They were proven to heal the same as a four layer bandage. They are slightly cheaper than a four layer bandage, but the beauty of them is, is actually that they prevent recurrence slightly better than a four layer bandage. And that's because you are brain training your patient of the requirement of that ongoing compression. And that's key to reducing the risk of recurrence. I also think from a practical point of view, if a patient has a hosiery kit, they can self-care. They can bath, they can shower, they can wear whatever shoes they want, they can wear whatever trousers they want. If you had a leg ulcer, what would you choose? Would you choose bandaging, where it limits you to getting the bath and the shower, or would you choose a hosiery kit? Hosiery kits also allows the patients to self-care for the wounds. Please don't think that's a bad thing. Don't think, gosh, they won't do that. Again, think of yourself as a patient. Would you rather have self-care? Or would you rather be told to come to see a nurse at a specific time twice a week for the next six weeks? How would any of us fit that in our busy lifestyle? I would certainly prefer to self-care. So the clinical navigation tool helps to give you permission to do that. It also ensures that we are using what we know is best in terms of some compression earlier on. Even if the diagnosis of that wound is uncertain, then we still can carry on that patient in 20 millimetres of mercury pressure. We're worried at times about compression and the worry of compressing, applying compression in patients with arterial disease. But there was a great study by Hugo Parch back now a few years ago, which showed that compression therapy actually he helps to heal arterial uh, ulcers and mixed disease leg ulcers. Within many vascular units, we're using compression on the worst of the worst purely arterial ulcers because we know if there's any form of edema, that will reduce your tissue perfusion. Reducing that edema will help. I'd like you all just to really change your perspective to say that compression is harmful. I would say no compression is more harmful than actually applying compression.
because remember the relationship between the venous system and the arterial system. Remember that capillary bed and the interlinking lymphatics that you can see within this picture. You can see how they are interlinked. If you've got swelling of your tissues on your capillary bed, you will both decrease the venous and arterial pressure. Therefore, you are aiding problems in terms of tissue perfusion. If you're able to you reduce that through compression therapy, that will help. So we've talked about a lot about the um, requirement of what we need to do. What we have also given you permission to do within the National Wound Care Strategy is actually for patients to be able to self-care for a period of time. We're simply saying that a patient should be reviewed by a qualified practitioner on a four weekly basis. So in between that four weeks, that patient could be solely cared for by themselves, by a family member or by a health care support worker. And that the only requirement for a registered nurse or registered podiatry to visit is if that patient of every four weeks or if that patient's showing signs of deterioration. You do need a good support system for your clinical support workers that if they are escalating patients to you, that they are seen as soon as possible. We also want the patients to have a four weekly review because if that wound care treatment plan is not working, we want that to be identified earlier. We want those patients to be assessed quicker and escalated up to your specialist services. That if that patient has not healed after 12 weeks, that that patient should be seen by some form of specialist clinic. Because we need to ensure that we've got advanced treatments for those patients earlier on in the pathway than we currently have. A lot of what I've talked about is going to be a real challenge in terms of the workforce and it's a huge step change but it's a step change that's been needing to come and this will help you and how you are working at this moment in time. For initial care it's up to everybody out there, pharmacists, GPs, every single nurse, every single clinician, every single physiotherapist, every single podiatrist. But the assessment needs to be done with somebody with advanced assessment skills who can do an ABPI but go beyond the ABPI if needed. The care providers between on a weekly basis can be anybody. It can be non-registered members of staff, it can be themselves, it can be a member of the family and that can continue for up to four weeks without a review from a registered professional. But every four weeks or earlier if there is escalation then that patient needs to be seen by a registered practitioner and that if the patient is not healed by 12 weeks that they should be referred on to a specialist wound clinic ideally with a consultant led service. That consultant may not be a medical consultant, but it should be some form of consultant. A lot of this is a challenge, but I think everybody out there will recognise at the moment in time, we do need that whole system change. We've got it so wrong. You can see the images in front of you right now. This is a patient that had a massive injury of their lower leg, and you can see the edema on their foot. But because that patient got the right care at the right time, that also was able to heal within six weeks. But imagine if that patient had to wait two or three weeks for an assessment, followed by five or six weeks for a specialist assessment. How bad would that edema have been by the time that they required compression therapy? But instead, you were able to capture that what could have been a very complex wound very early on in its stage, and you were able to get that to heal. That's the care that we all want to give, and that's the care that we need to be striving for. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Leanne. I don't know about you guys, but this is certainly a big shift in what people are doing, especially in the community, a shift that's definitely needed. Um, as being an ex-community nurse, I would have loved been able to put patients straight into compression without that fear. So this is, this is definitely what's needed. So I've just got a couple of questions based on what, what you've been talking about. Obviously, you talked a lot about bandaging and hosiery kits. And as we said, the RCTs and the evidence behind hosiery kits is... Is fundamentally where we need to go. Obviously, it's not always suitable to put a patient into bandaging, especially if there's any element of edema. Obviously, the evidence is still needed and growing where wrap compressions are concerned. So is wraps an alternative if a patient can't tolerate bandaging? Or At this moment in time, compression wraps were not included in the clinical navigation mm -hmm. tool because this is evidence-based. Yeah. And we have had steers from the Cochrane Group and the Manchester mm -hmm. researchers to say that at the moment, the evidence for compression wraps is not robust enough. Yeah. But I'm sure you're aware there has been just an announcement of some national funding for mm -hmm. a head-to-head -head trial of compression 
wraps yep. versus compression bandaging versus compression hosiery kits. Brilliant. So if the evidence does come out of this being a valuable mm -hmm. option, it will be added to the clinical navigation tool. Brilliant. When any patient's got a leg ulcer at this moment in time, you should be aiming for 40 millimetres of mercury pressure, mm -hmm. ideally through a bandage, if, well, ideally through a hosiery kit, yep. if the leg is suitable, if not, a bandage. Yep. That's what we should be aiming for. But if you've got a patient that won't tolerate compression bandaging, mm -hmm. who won't have got the ability or the right limb shape to put some hosiery on, yeah, yeah compression wraps are an alternative. Yeah. And anecdotally, they work. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you that from an evidence-based point of view. Yeah. When I find compression wraps the most beneficial is when you've actually got a patient to heal and you mm -hmm. want in long-term edema management and prevention strategies, Brilliant. especially in patients with morbid obesity because they can't touch the toes. So they can't put on any compression um, hosiery. Yeah. So using compression wraps in that patient is ideal because that type of enablement to get that patient to be able to self-care with their chronic disease that's going to be there forever is a key to getting them actually yeah. self-caring and away from nursing intervention. Brilliant. So ultimately, it's that long-term compression care, isn't it? It's about using what's available to reach your objective. Absolutely. And Brilliant. what the patient can do themselves, because ultimately, every patient should have a self-care solution. Yes. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Leanne. And obviously, we talk about getting it right first time, and this is a great way of us achieving that. Um, obviously, do you think that obviously buyers getting people into compression earlier, this is going to buy them into the fact of once they are healed in getting them to know that compression is for life? Yeah, and I think the, the delays in treatment, they don't understand why we're trying to put compression therapy on. Compression yeah. therapy is so beneficial in so many wounds. Yeah. If you've got a, a surgical wound dehistance with some edema on your lower leg, some compression is going to help. Yeah. If you've got a skin tear with swelling of your lower leg, some compression is going to help. If you've got a patient that's had a, 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 a removal of skin cancer, some compression is going to yeah. help healing. I think the earlier we get patients to understand the links between edema, venous insufficiency and the requirement of compression, the better it will all be. Yeah. I'm also hopeful that some of the fallout from this will be a bit more intervention of early edema. Yeah. Because at the moment the whole of the NHS is ignorant edema. We are actively ignoring it rather than treating it. Yeah. Wound care strategy can only do one thing at once. <laughs> This is part one, but don't worry, other things are on the radar Brilliant. that will be coming out later. So we'll be looking at more prevention rather than Absolutely. cure. Absolutely, and that's Excellent. the whole of the NHS. If we're ever going to meet the forward planning, that's what we need to do. Fantastic, fantastic. So obviously you mentioned that you enjoy created a pathway, generic pathway, didn't you? Absolutely. 2016. Has that, is that going to be updated or is it going to fall in line with the lower limb strategy? So um, and I'm quite active and passionate about lower legs. Um, and yes, I produce, me and Joy produce the Atkin and Tickle Leg Ulcer Algorithm. That is a separate piece of work than the work I've done with the National Wound Care Strategy. But I've been very clear, there is no point in having two hymn sheets, because right. if not, I'm just going to confuse the nursing audience that's out there. So the Leg Ulcer Algorithm has been updated Brilliant. to be able to stay in line in terms of identifying the red flags as part of the assessment. Yeah. It talks about the assessment at that two-week period, but the actual compression selection at the bottom hasn't changed. Brilliant. The idea is actually to publish this again yeah. um, to be able to say this is what we should be doing. Yeah. The, um, the, the Atkin and Tickle pathway is an evidence-based treatment pathway mm -hmm. and it talks about generics yeah. because there's no evidence to say one product is better than the other no. but there is evidence to say that certain approaches is better than the other yeah. so it doesn't matter what's on your local formula is you can use this as a decision-making tool and you can simply add in actually what products you are using locally. Yeah brilliant that's fantastic thank you very much. Right then guys so what we'll do is we'll just do a summary and obviously I'll be talking a little bit about what ST and how ST can support you guys out in the field um, and then we're going to go to the live Q&A where you'll be able to post questions to Leanne and we will we will aim to answer answer all your questions and queries so obviously at ST we have the Job's compression solutions so just to let you know that everything that Leanne has talked about tonight we have also care kits we have wrap compression systems and bandage kits to be able to support the whole theory behind what the lower limb national wound care strategy is trying to achieve 
Obviously, ST is a global health and medical solutions company that supports different therapy areas, and they may include continence, wound care, vascular, orthopaedics, and lymphology. And we do have a team of strategic healthcare partners that are dedicated to helping you and your local CCGs and trusts to implement long-term strategies to improve the clinical and financial outcomes of your trust. So again, we are here to help support you and to support Leanne and her team, as she mentioned alluded to at the beginning, where she, you're going to need industry partners to help you roll this out, aren't you, and to support people out in the field, and we're obviously there to do that. Um, as an added value service, what we're doing is tonight, there's nothing better than trying to convince patients to wear compression by understanding what it feels to like wear compression yourself. So um, as part of this seminar tonight, we are giving you the chance to request your own pair of Job's Dolce Shear um, or Job's for men below knee compression garments. You can do that by contacting our concierge service. And also, if you wanted to request a copy of Leanne's updated generic pathway, we can also send you a copy of that. And simply, you need to download the certificate and then contact SAT on the details on the screen, and we'll be able to help you further. And to help you with the measuring aspect of your below knee garments, if you choose that you'd like a pair, then here's the measuring points here that you would need to take. And obviously you can go back and look at this presentation again to get those measuring points if you're not quite familiar. What I've said to you so far, it's all in draft. We don't imagine any major amendments, but I want your, your what you think of all of this. It's you that's going to be helping us to implement all of this. There's no point of us picking this part. We need a national strategy because we need a whole system change to change the future of our patients. So if there's anything that you are thinking, do you know what, that's not going to work, I think they've got that bit wrong, please let us know. Our ears are open. All you need to do is to register on the website for the National Wound Care Strategy. You will be sent every piece of work that we've produced so far. You'll also have access to the toolkit that we're currently creating to help the implementation of this. So Sarah Jane, um, she said, is it better to wash the legs every time there is a compression dressing change or once a week? Every time. How often do you wash your legs, is my question back to Sarah Jane. You wash your legs every day, I can imagine. You've got to remember how much the skin sheds and the actual layers. Within your final layer of skin, there is 50 layers of skin that is constantly removing and regenerating. If you've got a patient in any form of compression, you're sticking those layers of skin on top of each other, often actually bedded down with further emollients. We need to be washing, cleansing and descaling the legs at each and every opportunity. It's a fundamental aspect of care and something that we need to get right back in there. Many of you might have problems with health and safety, lifting and handling, infection control. If you've got any of those, you need to find solutions. There's many solutions out there. The favourite thing still to me is a lined bowl of water with a piece of gauze and tap water, but I'm appreciative you might have issues with that. If not, there's some great leg wipes that you can use or some type of wiping pads that you can use. But whatever you are doing, you have to wash and cleanse that leg at each and every dressing change. And I suppose this is where the ulcer care kits come in and for self-care and getting the patient to be able to do that task themselves potentially or partly absolutely you know getting the patients to apply emollients on a daily basis will really improve their skin health brilliant thank you very much Sarah Jane so question two is from Stella um, what are the risks involved in compressing heart failure patients so we covered this all earlier on Stella actually in a chronic heart failure patient the risk is low in fact there isn't there's very hardly any risk and actually the risk of no compression is much higher so if you've got chronic Congestive cardiac failure, apply compression of those patients. Only in patients who are in acute heart failure do you need to have some consideration with. And I would say that there are some easy ways that you can look at that in terms of have they got acute breathlessness, a change in their symptoms over the last few days, have they got changes within that BNP blood test that you can assess whether a patient's in acute heart failure or progressing towards acute heart failure. In acute heart failure, link with your specialist. You, you, your coronary nurses, your, your cardiologists, have a conversation with those. But in chronic heart failure, it is not contraindicated. It's a common myth. It's actually a requirement because those patients will have edema of the lower legs. And if it's not controlled, they'll start with wet legs. And that's one thing we need to avoid. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Leanne. Thank you, Stella. So question three from Professor Karanuzi. So Leanne. 
How do we ensure clinicians are competent and capable of undertaking these assessments and implementing interventions? Thank you, Karen. So if anybody knows Professor Ruzi, she's actually my line manager at the <laughs> university, my <laughs> professor. So thank you for this question, Karen. Um, we need to ensure that we have a capable workforce. So there's two aspects of this. There's an individual, how do you prove that you're capable of doing this? But there's also a requirement for a service to look at, have we got the capability of the team to deliver this? Ultimately, your competence is a self-assessed thing. It's part of your revalidation if you're a registered practitioner. If you're not a registered practitioner, you need to look at individualised competency frameworks. Many of the organisations have got this, how we are allowing non-registered staff to put cannulas in. There's a competency framework. There's also national competency frameworks that is able you to prove this. There's a fantastic framework called Tissue Viability Leading Change that actually structures through competency in terms of how do you prove what you need to do. And then there's a document that I referred to from Health Education England that's looking at assessment of competency right at the top end of advanced clinical, clinical practice. So I think that it's about using frameworks to be able to prove that, to justify in yourself, but it's also not just to do with competency, but to do with confidence. And actually building up your confidence is the major thing that we need to do across our workforce. Brilliant. Thank you, Leanne. So question four. Question four is from Kirsty. So what are your views on patients with dementia who push their compression down and take their hosiery off? Good question. Um, <laughs> Managing patients with dementia is, is always a clinical challenge and what we need to do is to link with our dementia specialists if at all possible. It depends what type of dementia that they've got. Distraction therapies while you're dressing the bandages is really useful. Using the care team around you is really useful. But if you've got a patient that, that twiddles with them, You've got a couple of options. You can actually get twiddle blankets for patients to go on the knees. So they've got buttons and tassels that they play with. So we'll twiddle with that. Google twiddle blankets. There's a whole group of nana knitters that's produ producing twiddle blankets. They're absolutely fantastic. But if you've got a patient who is removing their bandages, what you can look at is putting on um, some type of tights over the top of it, you know, like a pop sock, to so the cat actually get to the bandage itself. The hosiery, they'll take on and off. For me, with patients like that, I do quite like compression wrap systems. And what I do is I put them on backwards. So therefore, the actual Velcro is at the back. So at the front, all they can see is a smooth garment. So therefore, it's much easier for them to remove. But it's about looking at what type of dementia your patient has and what are their triggers of that. Um, because there's multiple facets of how to manage patients with dementia. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsty. So question five is from Christine. So all great advice, but we are sometimes restricted by local guidelines, e.g. need for a Doppler before compression. What can we do? Your guidelines need changing. And I say that because it's that easy. But what is happening, because this is a national wound care strategy and it's led by the chief nurse of the north, she will be in contact with your local chief nurses who will be forcing this from a top down approach that your guidelines were and your policies will need to change as a result of this. This is a nationally funded strategy. There will be a requirement for each NHS organisation to implement it. There is a challenge of who's going to be the early adopters and who's going to be the late to, to start doing this. If, Christine, if you sound like a passionate person to be here right now, start escalating it up. Start talking to your line managers, to your nursing directors to say, do you know what's coming from the National Wound Care Strategy? How can we enable our organisation to be fit for purpose when this finally comes out? Implementation of this starts next year. So your policies need to be in step with that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So the final question is from Jackie. So very excited by this presentation. However, so many nurses are afraid of doing ABPI. How do we change this mindset? You just need to remember what an ABPI is a blood pressure. What were the first thing that you were taught in your nursing career? Temperature, respirations, pulse, and how to do a blood pressure. It's no more simple. It's no more difficult than that. We need to just think about what it is and how far our profession has come along. And I, I, I use the great analogy. C can you remember IV antibiotics used to be given by a doctor? They got bored of it, give it to a nurse. We got bored of it, we give it to a pharmacist. Putting cannulas in, doctors used to do it. They give it to nurses, we give it to HCAs. Doing bloods is the same. We're just moving on. We just need to not be afraid of doing the assessment. The harm is by doing apathy, by doing nothing. It is simply a blood pressure test of a leg. 
It can be trained within two days to be able to do this. If you've got fear and anxiety, think about how you can overcome that. Buy a machine if you want, as an automated machine, if it's a barrier to you getting an ABPI. Any way of doing that arterial assessment is good enough. But remember, what the National Wound Care Strategy has given you, it's given you permission to apply 20 millimetres of mercury pressure without an ABPI. So if we're able to do that from the highest level, doesn't that just sort of prove that it's not harmful to do this? And therefore the ABPI is not just the pivotal assessment that we've always put as hat to. It's a barrier to care, it's a barrier to compression. We need to be thinking about how we reduce those barriers to get patients best care. Thank you again for watching and see you next year.